Okay, so I thought I would start uh, today with the theory side and then switch to the practice side um, and look at the limits of determinism. So one of the things that is sort of an obsession of mine is this use of deterministic models. And um, I, I want to, I want you guys to not, I, I don't think there's any risk that I'm gonna totally brainwash you, but just in case, okay? I, I want you to know <laughs> that non-determinism is a real thing and that you do have to deal with it. And, uh, and sometimes it's actually a very useful thing, okay? So that's what I'd like to talk about first uh, today. So what are the limits of determinism? Some of these we've already talked about, so I don't need to go into much detail, but, um, but sometimes, you know, building deterministic models is just hugely complex and they become unanalyzable. So when, you're, when your goal is to be able to analyze models and, and to uh, um, you know, be able to figure out how they behave under anomalous behaviors, for example, then um, you may not be able to do it with deterministic models. Um, my favorite example of this, this is a picture of a, uh, an, input, a, an Airbus A350. It's actually most of the A350. It just is missing um, the, the skin and the structural elements. It's actually sort of weird to look at because it has like hydraulic tubes that bend around a strut, but there's no strut there. Um, but it's an exact replica of all of the working parts of an A350. And uh, I, I took this picture when I was being given a tour uh, of the, uh, the place where the final assembly occurs for the A350. It's actually built all over Europe. And very oddly, they build you know, in segments of the fuselage in one place, and then they load them onto this really weird plane that is the most bizarre plane I've ever seen called the Beluga. And it's, it is a plane with a big enough belly to have a cargo hold that can hold a complete segment of a jumbo aircraft, okay, inside. So it looks like, it looks really weird. It looks like a cartoon character, right? This big bulbous plane with tiny little wings coming out. <laughs> um, and it flies segments of this plane around Europe so that they all end up eventually in Toulouse where they get assembled into an aircraft. So anyway, this um, iron wing is a replica of all of the hardware on the A350. It doesn't have uh, the actual engines, the gas powered part of the engines, but it has significant parts of the engine. So for example, it has the electric power generators of the engines. And uh, what they do is they have electric motors that simulate the spinning of the engines that drive the electric power generator, which then powers up the replica of the aircraft, the electronic parts. And they have all of the wires are exactly the same length as they are on the real plane. Um, all of the moving mechanical parts and hydraulic parts are exact replicas of what's actual, actually on the plane. And they use this for um, mostly for uh, checking how the plane behaves under failures. Okay, when some component fails, uh, what's it going to do? And Building a simulation of this that was is sufficiently accurate is is probably uh, probably impossible. Uh, there was, by the way, a railing regulated right section of that one. We had a picture, uh, sorry, a sign on it that said "No photography allowed." And I um, asked my tour guide, uh, "I see, I see the sign. Uh, can I take a picture?" And he said, "Well, uh, not if I see you do it." And then he turned his back. <laughs> So I took a picture. Uh, so there it is. Okay, there's another situation that's very current where um, having a deterministic model is not necessarily useful, which is when, you're, when you have a significant uh, deep neural network component in your system and you're trying to model the inference behavior. And the reality is that um, you can build a deterministic model of a neural network inference engine. In fact, most of the time, the programs that implement these things are deterministic models. It's just they're not very analyzable deterministic models. 
And so uh, you might do better to model that particular component in the system non-deterministically in order to understand overall behavior of the system. So that's another situation that's very relevant these days. You might need non-determinism if you just don't know everything. Well, you never know everything, right? So the question is, you know, what do you want to, uh, um, to leave out? Um, and in, in, in this circumstance, you might do well with probabilistic models. And I want to emphasize there's a, there's a difference between a non-deterministic model and a probabilistic model. Um, does anybody know what that difference is? So a probabilistic model quantifies the likelihood of an outcome. So it's about probability, whereas a non-deterministic model is only about possibility. It says, these are the things that can occur, but it doesn't say anything about how likely one thing is over another, okay? Um, it turns out that, uh, large part of modern probability theory was developed by Pierre-Simon Laplace, who was who a, a French scientist, obviously, from the name. Um, but Laplace believed that the world was completely deterministic. In fact, he's famous for what's now called Laplace's demon, where he said that um, if you had a, a, um, an enormous intelligence that could observe the positions and momentum of all of the particles in the universe, then it would be able to predict the future and would have a complete record of the past of the universe, okay? So the past and present would become visible to this demon. So Laplace believed the world was deterministic, but nevertheless developed the core of modern probability theory. Isn't that a contradiction? Well, it turns out not because of this guy, Thomas Bates. Um, interestingly, uh, this, is, this is the picture that's always used when someone wants to show a picture of Thomas Bates, but, but historians of science pretty much agree that that's not a picture of Thomas Bates. They, they don't, we don't have a picture of Thomas Bates, so we just use this one. <laughs> um, but anyway, Bayes was a, um, uh, a cleric um, who thought a lot about uh, probability and reasoning about uncertainty and so forth. And he developed a whole way of thinking about probability that was simply about what we don't know, not about some intrinsic randomness in the world, okay? It's, it's called a Bayesian approach to, to probability. And uh, Laplace was a Bayesian. His interpretation of probability was as a measure of uncertainty, what you don't know not a measure of randomness in the world, okay? So, um, so anyway, there's no, no real contradiction. So I talk, I've talked already about chaos, so I'm not gonna say anything more about that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my favorite um, limit of determinism. And it's my favorite in part because I've, I'm, I think I'm the first to have really figured this out. I, uh, published a result in this paper uh, in 2016, which I love the fact that it's in volume one, number one of the ACM transactions on cyber physical systems, the very first issue of that journal, okay? And it's about fun fundamental limits of cyber physical system modeling. And this paper has a result that shows that um, any set of deterministic models, if it's rich enough to describe the physical world, it's incomplete, okay? And incomplete is a very technical term here. It's, a, it's actually a mathematical term. It means that there's holes in this set of models where non-determinism can sneak in, okay? And I wanna show you uh, how, it's, how this, uh, this proof is constructed because it's really quite simple. Okay, um, it looks at a very simple physical problem under a Newtonian model of physics. So when, when I say a set of models rich enough to describe the physical world, 
what I mean specifically by that is that it includes Newton's laws. And a little bit more, it includes the possibility of discrete behaviors. Things like an abrupt collision where, you know, like the disturbance in your, um, in your pendulum, okay? An instantaneous change in velocity. So any set of models that has those two things, Newton's laws plus the ability to have abrupt disturbances is incomplete, okay? And consequently will admit non-deterministic behaviors. And I can show this by example. So consider two billiard balls all right, on a frictionless table. So there, we're gonna idealize these. So when they collide, there's no loss of energy. So that we're gonna treat that as a discrete behavior, a collision, okay? It's not there one instant, it is there the next instant, okay? So um, what's your intuition? If you have a ball sitting still on a, such a table and a ball approaches it, what's gonna happen when they collide? I, I sort of heard of several of the possible answers. It depends somewhat on their masses, right? If they have identical mass, then under this idealized Newtonian model, the red ball will stop and the blue ball will acquire its momentum. Okay, so it'll move away at the same velocity. That the red ball is in this direction. Right now, the way you derive this is you use the conservation laws from physics, which is conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Okay, two laws. So, conservation of momentum is right here. So, these, the v, v primes are the velocity of the ball after the collision, and the Vs without the primes are the velocity before the collision. The M's are the masses of the balls. And conservation of momentum, so the total momentum before the collision is here on, on the right. And the total momentum after the collision is here on the left. So conservation of momentum requires that this equation be true. Energy is similar, except that it's proportional to the square of velocity. Okay, so you can write down conservation of kinetic energy and now you have two equations and two unknowns. And in general, two equations and two unknowns could have two distinct solutions. And in fact, in this case, there are two distinct solutions. What are the two solutions? Yes. Sorry. simpler. So one of the solutions is trivially simple, okay, which is that the red ball passes right through the blue ball without interacting with it. So the velocities after the collision are the same as the velocities before the collision, and that satisfies all the equations. Okay. Well, that's a tunneling solution. Um, but that's not a very physical physically satisfying solution, right? So why don't we just say that doesn't happen? Okay, we'll rule we'll that one out. So if we rule that one out, then there's only one possible solution. And it does depend on the masses, but if the masses are identical, then the only solution for V1 prime and V2 prime um, is that the velocities switch. Okay, masses are the same. So you get a deterministic behavior to rule out the tunnel solution. So we have a deterministic model under the assumption that tunneling is not allowed. Okay, so these are the two solutions. You can write down the, the, the first solution is rather trivial, the velocity are unchanged. Second solution, you can derive it and it does depend on the masses. And if the masses are not the same, it's a little more complicated. Both balls stay in motion, but um, if you can derive what it's going to be. Okay, so let's just augment the situation a little bit. 
Suppose you've got this blue ball sitting still on the table. Now you have two balls approaching it from opposite sides. Okay. What do you think is going to happen if they collide simultaneously? They both what? Right from the same side. Yeah. They, they bounce, they bounce away with the same speed. Okay. Again, we rule out the tunneling possibility. And that would conserve momentum and energy. Okay. But it turns out that if you actually write down the equations now, um, we have three unknowns and two equations. And that's more problematic. Two equations is uh, under constraining the problem. And it turns out that in general, with unequal masses, there's actually an infinite number of solutions. Okay. Newton's laws don't give us a unique answer to the behavior. All right, but it gets weirder. All right. So, by the way, the way that I first discovered this was that we were uh, working on simulators for hybrid systems. Uh, at Berkeley, and hybrid systems are systems that mix continuous behaviors described by differential equations with discrete behaviors like mode transitions. Okay, collisions and mode transitions are both discrete behaviors. Okay, so there's this whole field of hybrid systems that works on that kind of model. And um, we were building a simulation engine that was using this notion of super dense time to give a really clean model. For hybrid systems. I talked about super dense time the last time. And um, when I, I started working on a simulation of this problem with the software that we had built, and I said, okay, well, one way to handle the two simultaneous collisions is just to handle them non deterministically in some order, as, as if each was a two ball collision. Okay, so I could pick to handle one of the one of the collisions, say the, the one on the left, okay? And let's assume for the moment that all the masses are the same. So what's gonna happen? When, when I handle this collision, the momentum of the red ball gets transferred to the blue, blue ball. Okay, so the, the red ball will now have zero momentum, the blue ball will have non-zero momentum. But we don't let time elapse and we have a new collision. Okay, but again, it's only a two ball collision. So without time elapsing, I've got now two balls uh, approaching each other with equal momentum. I can find the deterministic solution. I rule out the tunneling solution, okay? Find the deterministic solution, handle that collision. You can now have the two balls moving away from each other with equal momentum, but again, don't let time elapse. We're using super dense time here. And now we have a new collision, this one right here. Okay, we handle that collision and we transfer momentum to the red ball. And sure enough, Ali's intuition is exactly what gets delivered to us, right? So that works. But I found that in the software, if the masses were different, then I got a different answer depending on whether I handled the left collision first or the right collision first. And I was convinced there was a bug in the software because in super dense time, without time elapsing, nothing should be happening and no state should be changing in any way that would affect position. So I was convinced there was a bug in the software. I hunted for it for a couple of weeks tried lots of little corner cases, and then finally decided, well, maybe I should write down Newton's equations for this, and realized that there's an infinite number of solutions. And by choosing to handle these two collisions as, as pairwise collisions in non-deterministic order, I was finding only two of, of an infinite number of possibilities, okay? These were the particular trajectories that the simulator was giving me, and they were they were distinctly different, you know, for 
for these two uh, cases. All right, so let's step back and look at this from a physics perspective. Um, the, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you can't know the position and the momentum of a particle with perfect accuracy. You can't know both with perfect accuracy. And yet, when we're talking about simultaneous collisions, in order for those collisions to actually be simultaneous, we have to know position and momentum exactly at the same time. Right? So physics tells us that there's a little bit of a problem with the formulation. It's not accurate from a physics perspective. It's weird to invoke Heisenberg uncertainty principle on macroscopic objects like this. But it's not weird because of the discreteness of the collision. But as soon as we're talking about something being actually simultaneous, um, we're going to have to look at limiting cases. Okay. So here's where it gets ex exceedingly weird. So now let's let's treat this simultaneous collision as a limiting case. Okay. Assume that the collision is not perfectly simultaneous. So the, the yellow ball collides with the blue a little bit later. It's just a little bit behind. Right? So let tau be the time between collisions. Then you find that no matter how small you make tau, the system is perfectly determinist. Every collision is a two ball collision. And as long as we rule out the tunneling solution, we always get a deterministic answer. And now let's look at a limiting case and let tau approach zero. And you get a sequence of models that are become almost indistinguishable as tau gets very close to zero. But you get a completely different sequence depending on whether you approach zero from the positive side or from the negative side. Okay. So you can, in fact, formally use these tau's uh, to construct a sequence of models that have a particular mathematical property called the Cauchy property, which means that they're each, these models are getting closer and closer to each other, okay? Which means that there should be a limit. But if the space of models is incomplete, there is no limit. It's not in the set. And that's what happens in this case. The, the model that these, that this, these sequences of models seem to be converging to is not in the set of deterministic models. So the set of deterministic models is incomplete. It's got these holes. Um, there's a couple of ways that you could fix this. This is kind of disturbing, right? Because it says most of us, I think, at least when I was working with this, I had sort of, I had been brainwashed into believing that the whole Newtonian system was deterministic, right? Um, it's not, it allows non-determinism. Um, and this is only one example. I've found actually subsequently a whole bunch of other examples where Newtonian systems can exhibit non-determinism. Um, but there, there is, for this particular case, there is one way to solve the problem, which is to disallow discrete behaviors to say nothing is ever discrete. You can never talk about something occurring at an instant. Okay, so one way that you could do that with these, with these billiard balls is to say, well, the collision isn't instantaneous. As they get very close together, they start to interact with one another. But the, the interaction gradually increases, okay? The balls compress as they, as they are in the process of colliding. And then they decompress to exchange energy, right? But rule out the discrete kind of behavior. So it turns out if you do that, um, you get chaotic behavior in this case, where the, the possible behaviors, uh, which can be very different from one another, depend on infinitesimally small changes in your initial conditions. Okay, 
So you can trade off determinism for chaos. Um, but there's a worse consequence, okay? I show in this paper that if you disallow discrete behaviors, you also have to give up causation. The notion of causation breaks down, all right? And there's an example given in this paper where um, it's a, it's actually a very practical circuit example. It's called a flyback diode. And uh, it's, uh, it's a practical, does anybody here have experience with diesel engines? Um, there's, there's actually a lot of situations where you, you, you can't simply remove an electrical current instantaneously without creating a hell of a problem. Okay. Um, anytime you have an inductive load, Inductive, an inductive load means that if there's current flowing through, the current wants to keep flowing. If you try to cut off the current instantaneously, the voltage can, in theory, go pretty quick. And you get parking, and you do a lot of damage to the equipment. So there's a way to prevent that using the diode, which shunts the current when you open that switch. Okay. So this particular circuit has a property that when you look at it in, in an idealized way, um, when the switch is open, the switch is completely in control. It's causing the current J to be zero. When it's closed, the diode is in complete control of the voltage. It's causing the voltage to be a certain point. And when you switch between these modes, if you do it instantaneously, you go from the switch being the cause to the diode being the cause. But if you disallow a, a, a discrete switch, you go through an intermediate phase where there is no cause. And you can't find a cause for the, for the current and the, and the voltage. And so the price that you pay if you give up discrete behaviors is you, you have to give up on the notion of causation being fundamental, which is, I think, a pretty big cost. So, um, so non-determinism is unavoidable if if you have a rich enough set of models. Um, it's always going to be there, lurking in the background. So, one thing you might say, and you know, I hear this a lot. With I, I, I've been obsessed with deterministic models for a long time, and people say. You know, the physical world's unpredictable anyway. Why don't you just design your system to tolerate unpredictability? Um, so non-determinism is un un unavoidable. Just embrace it and live with it. Well, you know, death is unavoidable, but you want to usually you want to go about trying to avoid it, right? <laughs> so it's not a good argument, basically. And you know the issue. I think I've ma I've made this point several times, right? But the question is not whether deterministic models can describe the behavior of cyber-physical systems. That's not the question that is interesting, in my perspective. The question that is interesting is the question of whether we can build cyber-physical systems whose behavior matches that of a deterministic model with high confidence. You never get perfect models. Um, the other thing is that deterministic models don't eliminate the need for robust fault tolerant designs. Stuff will go wrong and your, the, the determinism of your model will not keep bad stuff from happening, okay? Um, but an interesting property is that deterministic models make it much easier to detect failures. If you have a very well-defined notion of what is correct behavior, you can build in detectors into your system that detect anomalous behaviors and say, okay, somewhere one, some assumption I made is no longer satisfied. My system has gone into a failure mode. I better handle that, right? But if you started with non-deterministic models, you may not even be able to detect the failures. This is what happened with the, uh, with the autoware example. Remember that I talked about that Sarush Mateni um, discovered where the, um, the car simulator could report that the gear was in reverse and the car was moving forward. 
And that was just because of a reordering of the messages. But if you had a deterministic model and your deterministic model says that's impossible and you get a sensor reading that says that's the case, then you know you're in a failure mode, okay? And you, you should design your system to handle such failure modes by doing something, fall, fall back to some safety condition. Okay, but you don't want to fall back to a safety condition if it's a normal behavior just due to the random reordering of messages in the network, right? So, so my claim is that deterministic models make it easier to design fault tolerant systems, not harder. Okay, so there's some references for this and